Okay, so it's come to my awareness that many people don't read anymore. So I have um, this magazine I made in 2005 that took a bit of work to do, and um, people don't appear to be reading it, uh, so I'm going to read it out. And you can watch this video and hear what it is. And I'll, uh, I might, um, link you to the, link you to the page on, um, Bandcamp where you can buy the PDF if you want. It's got all the paintings that I did. Um, or I may, may, might make it open source. Like, it seems like everything kind of is, but I've got to try and get 20 bucks here and there. So I don't get called a beggar, like this prick called me tonight. Bruh, what a ego. Okay. Here we go. This is Saka Interviews, Saka 3, 2005. Eldest Son of the Eldest Son, an interview with Aroa Rangatira Paul Tapsil. By me, Rawiri Patterson. Wait a minute. Eldest Son of the Eldest Son, an interview with Arawa Rangatira Paul Tapsil. <coughs> I'm going to see if I can do this all the way through. Uh, interview with a really interesting guy with Maori ancestry, bro. <laughs> Hi, Paul. How's it going? Oh, pretty cool. <laughs> do you think that, this is my question. Do you think that conscience breaks down cultural boundaries, that the inherent rightness part of a person transcends cultural boundaries? Paul's answer. I think that being conscious is an important part of being an individual on our planet. At the same time, though, conscience is a part of realizing you are connected to all living things on this planet, and there is a sense that you have an obligation to look after others if you are ever to look after yourself. Ooh, that's a fire one. Ooh, write that one down, everyone. Kitties, probably the teenagers are the only one that have time to listen to this. It's going to be pretty, pretty long. Can a Pākehā become Māori by living along Māori lines? And vice versa, can a Māori become Pākehā by living along Pākehā lines? Answer is living within a Maori community, whether you're Pakeha or Maori, is about belonging, and is a, it's about recognizing your obligations to that community. I have met Pakeha that have been brought up in Maori communities, and in my opinion, have been more Maori than a lot of Maori I have met. Ooh, that's a stunner. I thought that was a stunner. I want a stunner. It's a stunner. A good and bad concept. Uh, this is my question. A good and bad a concept in both cultures. Absolutely, and without bad, how do you measure good? It's relative, and it's something to always keep us real, understanding where we stand within that continuum. Always to strive to be better is probably the best way of describing it. It doesn't matter what, who, what culture you're from, in my opinion. Ooh, he's on to it. Paul Tapsley, legend. What well, is my question? Would a Maori who was not taught ancient Maori ways be the same as a Dane who was not taught ancient Danish ways brought up in New Zealand? I think anyone who claims to belong to a community is actually claiming to have an identity. In contradistinction to others, part of belonging is knowing your past knowing your heritage and knowing how you arrived where you are today from that past. Oh, this guy's both. Why does violence seemingly go hand in hand with the popular views of Mouldydom? And why do you think a lot of negative impact has been felt by Mouldy, particularly since colonization? Paul's amazing answer is, it's probably connected to the last question. Stereotyping of our people has been brought about by the sense of identity being ascribed, being placed on Māori, due to the, lim con the limited contact between the two peoples. Violence is a big part of Māori society today, 
and once Willow is, as the film was alluding to that. I think it comes about in the 19th century with the alienation of our people from the resources that used to nourish us. With the land, the ocean, the foreshores, and with that came frustration, and out of that frustration has come violence, and unfortunately it's male-dominated. The sense of ego within men, our Māori men, has taken a real bashing by the colonial system for many decades. My, uh, I said, that could be also since the land enclosures in most countries as in England and Scotland. Similar things happen throughout the Western world. It's inherent to capitalism. Individualization of title brings about the opportunity to purchase that land of the individual, but it's owned owned collectively owned by a collective group which belongs to that parcel of land it's very hard to prize a group of people off land but if you individualize it you can pick them off one at a time and that's been a well-practiced colonization technique for hundreds of years it was used here in new zealand in ireland scotland and north america my question there are no doubt great Māori as well as great Pākehā. Does the division between cultures imply this, or is it the, is the division far subtler, naming people Māori according to their great attributes? I think that when people say a person is great, persons great are great Māori. It's in a sense of owning them because they represent the values that Māori are generally ascribe to. Māori values and Pākehā values in some instances are different, but I don't want to polarize the discussion. I'd rather look at where are the similarities, where there are similarities and integrations of both values. That's what makes us New Zealanders today. How Māori values have become part of New Zealand values and have blended with European values to make who we are as New Zealanders really unique. So I see any person, no matter whether they're Māori or Pākehā or a mixture of both, if they have lived true and have maintained integrity, and serve the people for the betterment of the nation, I see them as great people because they have put others before themselves and have served, and there are a number of Māori and a number of Pākehā that have done that. But all of them in my mind are great New Zealanders. <sighs> Wolf. Tish. Megan. Answer. What are Māori values and how are they different from today's mainstream Pākehā values? Māori values are best described or understood through the Marae. If you understand the Marae culture of Māori, then you Marae Māori, Marae, Marae, <laughs> then you can begin to understand the values that Māori hold dear to their hearts. That's about genealogical connection to the past through ancestors and how understanding that past makes the present more easily negotiated. So, for example, fuck a papa. Genealogy, as women folk use it in our tribes, binds and ties us all together as one family. A tangihanga, when someone dies, that Māori value unites us in grief, but also helps the grieving family get over the pain of loss and realise that that pain has been shared by all the kin. When men use whakapapa, they often use it in oratory to distinguish one group from another. It becomes an art of separation, but it's only done so much as to ensure boundaries between two different kin groups are maintained, and in due course, when the ceremony is finished, we all hongi, and the hongi is about joining us back together as one kin. I think Pākehā, Western traditional European communities, have their own ways of ensuring that they relate to the resources around them, and also main, of maintaining the well-being of their immediate kin groups. Maybe since the Second World War, definitely since urbanization, this goes for Māori as well. Young people growing up in cities have separated from those old values and not understanding where they've come from very well and consequently not sure why or how they've come to be where they are today and how to reconnect with apparent Māori values or any other value that's about community. My question. <laughs> But he's just so, that's the saddest shit and it is incredible. Fuck. Oosh. <laughs> okay. I want to say my bank has zeros right now. Just, just, yo. Just so you know. Whatever. 
I'm serving you motherfuckers right now. Do you see? I could do anything right now, but I'm doing this. <laughs> I want you to hear this shit. Even if I get nothing, whatever, fuck it. It's all good. That's for the people, for yo, yo, yo. Do you see a lot of racism surrounding issues Māori? I see a lot of ignorance. Racism is a term that you'd use for someone who's deliberately undermining someone because of their skin colour. They actually think that that skin colour makes them the person they're racist against inferior or that culture has made them the person they're racist against inferior. They think that there is something actually genetically wrong. Prejudice, racism, prejudice, racism comes out of that. But if you dig a bit deeper, it probably comes out of getting of one group getting an economic or political advantage over another, and it's a bit of sour grapes. That's probably racism in New Zealand. Like right now, you've got Maori jumping up and down over the foreshore. They're saying that's confiscation. You've got the rest of New Zealand, the Pākehā, going. But hang on a sec, we've all got the rights of the foreshore. That's everyone's land. That's out of ignorance without understanding how it has come about that the foreshores until now have been everyone's right to access. It's on whose authority originally was the treaty allowed to occur. It, it is those hapu, those kin groups that belong to each of those foreshores that have allowed access to them. If you don't include that understanding in any analysis of the foreshore, then you run the risk of people operating out of ignorance, out of, hey, I own that, or I own this, then the whole circle goes again, then frustration, then violence, and then blah, blah, blah. <laughs> My nana was going on about nudic speech. Oh, she's talking about nudic speech, because that's her cousins or something, and she was like, they're trying to make me pay to go down my cousin's beach, stuff that, well that's the foreshore, if someone's got to maintain the road, <laughs> remind your nana why the foreshore's all gone down there, have you been down there lately, recently, hell no, I have never ever been there in my entire life, what do you think I am, rich or something, I say, no, <laughs> he says, the whole beat, that was his point till I put me in, yeah, why not? The whole beach has washed away because the sand that used to come along Papa Moore Beach come around the point and keep redistributing sand to Nudix Beach to act as the buffer to protect the foreshore all ends up going back into the Kaituna river mouth because the river is no longer flowing and spitting the sand out so the sand that should have gone down to Nudix Beach has ended up in the Kaituna River mouth, the sand that was on Nudix Beach has continued going east back down Puke Hina Beach. The sand migrates all the time with the storms. As sand leaves, new sand arrives, and no new, no new sand has arrived around Makatu Point for about 20 years or 20 years or 30 years since they did the Kaituna cut and stopped that river from flowing through the Kaituna River mouth. It goes out through the Kaituna cut now, three kilometers further up, so the whole estuary has just filled up with sand. Billions of tons of sand now sits in the Indus in the estuary. Wow, that's a lot. Is that a correct fact? That's insane. That should have redistributed around the and protected Nudix Beach, and the point is just being eroded away. So there's a good example of things going wrong. Oh, that's horrific. That's a horror, horror story. Uh, what do you think of the statement, we are all New Zealanders? Yeah, but some more Māori than others. Ah, he answered so epic. I asked that because of my stepdad. He loves the Warriors and Stacey Jones. He said that, and my stepdad keep saying it, I mean, Stacy said that, I think, yeah, he did, and my stepdad keeps saying it, and I'm like, okay, where do you get this from, Stacy Jones, Stacy Jones is your relation, yeah, mom said that, I saw him at food alley once, <laughs> you should have said, hi cuz, <laughs> wow, I'll be so stressed, I nearly said hello, but I was so, so far. I was with the skaters, Paul Duffy, Keith Duffy, Steve K, 
Oh, I'm so psyched out. Oh, some of us are. I was so psyched. Oh, yeah. It was cool. That was just the week before the grand final when they won it. The bar was with Arwen Goodville, Stacey, and their kids. Ah, what a day. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Do you hold your culture and heritage as precious to you? Absolutely. But my culture, my heritage, my culture is dependent on the context where I might express that preciousness. So if I'm overseas, I'll talk about New Zealand culture and how that's a blend of being Māori and being Danish, Irish. Or if I'm back down at Rotorua, my expression of my of preciousness about my culture will be about being Ngāti Whakaui as opposed to being Ngāti Pikyao. But if I'm standing at o o o Ho Channel, I'll talk about my Ngāti Pikyao identity and how I relate to that, that land there. And my reference to my past, my ancestral connection to any particular land, whether I'm within New Zealand or whether I'm outside New Zealand or Aotearoa, are nevertheless precious because it is me and the way I interpret my heritage is different from my from any other person on this planet. That is what that's what makes me me and you you. Whoa fuck this dude's a flipping bonfire of knowledge. Okay. Do you want to know more of this my question? Do you want to know more about your culture? We had only one hour, so I had to push through to get these questions. I had a, about 30 uh, written uh, on a page, like printed out at the library. Or I think we had a printer at our house at Onihua Road. Okay, do you want to know more about your culture and heritage? I know this is a bit of a rhetorical question since I have read your thesis about our ancestor Pukaki. A spell mistake there. Wow, there's a few in here. I worked so hard. It's pre spell checkers, everyone. If you get this on the physical copy, wow, that's that's gonna be worth ten whole bucks. <laughs> okay. Okay. Since I have read your, your thesis on our ancestor Puka here. The best way to an answer that is that I always see myself as a child, always seeking, learning, and I'll do that until I can draw no further breath in this world. Me. Who is the most respected Māori person in your life? He obviously said me. Because I'm the G. No jokes. Of course not. The person that comes to my mind that I have most respect for, I'm thinking of those pastors, Kiru Waiaka, an elder from home. When my wife and I went overseas to study at Oxford, and we had a bit of reluctance, he said, go and become the best person you can become so you can better serve your people. That's one of those things that has stuck with me. At the time I thought I understood it, but the older I've become, the more I realize how deep that is, what it really means to serve your people. People today are so focused on their rights as Māori that they forget the flip side of rights, and that's responsibility, the ability to respond being accountable. When you weigh it all up, being accountable, being responsible, is far heavier than any right or perceived privilege that might come with serving or being in a position to serve. Until you've been there and felt that weight, on the outside it looks like, oh look at them, they just sit at the top table. Or, why are they wearing a cloak? All they see are the rights, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Underneath the water are all the issues and seriousness of decision making. When making those decisions, it is important to always put others before yourself. The ultimate decision might be to make a decision that might cost you your own life so that it saves others. That's the ultimate responsibility of leadership. I hope that answers your question in a roundabout way. <laughs> Five more than answers my questions. You, this is like the best interview I've ever seen. It's the Mickey. Do you consider yourself Maori? That's my question. He says this stunned me. I consider myself Maori. I consider myself a New Zealander. I consider myself Nate Fakoe. I consider myself a Tapsil. But most of all, I consider myself Paul. Bruh. That'll take a while for me to get. That's not what I expected at all. 
do you know why so many more uh, sorry i have to push through the questions I, there's only an hour this guy's like super flash owl owl bro i'll follow uhorio bro do you know why so many maori love watching and playing rugby actually just on that other question that's only half the story the other half is what other people consider me and whether they wish to consider me maori that's their decision Fuck, they don't consider me Māori at all. Personally, talking for myself, I'm a white, I'm just a white dude. They laugh at me. Like, he's just a schizo. Fuck, straight up. All the time. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Or not if you whether they consider me Māori, that's their decision. Or not if you or just poor. That will be a measure of how well I serve them or that group as to what they want to call me. So your con this is what I said. So your contribution is valuable because you're a part of their contribution as a whole, and assisting and empowering their kin groups and allowing them to move forward in their consciousness, conscience raising of being Maori, whatever that means for them. If I facilitated that and assisted in their Maori values that surround their journey, then undoubtedly. They will consider me to be Māori rather than consider me to be Pākehā. But when I'm engaging with a Danish community concerning our great-great-grandfather, they'll be considering me Danish. If I'm engaging with an Irish community regarding my Irish side of the family that has lived here in Auckland for almost 150 years, they will be considering me part of that Irish community. So the community has a big say in who you are. But it's only 50%. The other 50% is how you see yourself. I often see Māori rejecting what the community might be actually saying, which goes into your next question about sport. Being Māori on the sports field is seen as being well as part of who you are, and the better you are as a Māori on the sports field, on a sports field, the the more Māori you'll be ascribed because everyone wants to own you as Māori especially the Māori community. Oh, Stacy Jones, he is one of ours. He's a Māori. He's a Tapsil. Like that. Whereas if Stacy Jones was one of the other 400 Tapsils, I'd, I'm a Tapsil cousin or whatever you want to call me. That's what Paul said. <sighs> Am I a Tapsil? Whatever, I mean, whatever. Playing rugby, but never made it to the Warriors or to the All Blacks? Apart from the immediate family, no one else is really going to know that he is a Tapsil. Like how many people knew Dion Muir was a Tapsil? Was, is, is a Tapsil. I did, because you guys told me. <laughs> but the rest of the world didn't even really know he was, he is Māori, until he fronted up to the Māori All Blacks, and they were like, oh, he's Māori. And I said, but he looks it. Yeah, he looks it. But then Christian, <laughs> but then Christian Cullen, I'm Maori, and he plays for the Maori All Blacks. A few weeks later, I think I'm someone. Really? He's got no Maori heritage. Holy shit, that's a trip. How's that for a trip? That's buzzy. That is so buzzy. But I thought, and I read in the North and South that he's a Naitahu. Yeah, I don't know. But then, do we believe everything the media tells us? God knows. I mean, I could be wrong too. He mightn't be Samoan either. <laughs> Oosh. What was that sports one again? Do you know why so many Māori love watching and playing rugby? It's a sport of aggression. It's a sport of teamwork. So there's a sense of community on the field, but also it allows you to aspire as an individual. And at the end of it, you're no better than the team. But as an individual, you can't help the, you can help the team win. It probably aligns with Māori values, especially pre-contact days quite nicely, like going out to war, doing a haka together, and each individual has got to stand up and be counted. And if you win, then the whole kin group celebrates because your identity continues. If you lose, not only do you lose your life, but your whole kin group loses their lives as well, or become slaves of the conquering tribe. So rugby is a metaphor in our modern time for what going to war was for our young men 200 years ago, the thrill of combat. Yeah, this is me, <laughs> this is me talking.
Yeah, I'm just thinking in skateboarding you've got your crew as well and you represent for a particular place and like everyone knows you as from your crew, like you show them your skills and the other ones show you theirs like a battle. Paul says, it's like the haka, who had the best haka. Often the war was decided on the best haka. The other team would turn around and go home. And I said, whoa, oh yeah. Like when you see the Māori All Blacks do it, the other team goes, oh shit. And he said, I'm not going to front up to these guys. We'll get our asses kicked. Yeah, nice. <laughs> not these days, but in 2005, I think, yeah, people were a bit more scared of it. Now they just play the game. Plan the kill. I said, was there a stigma towards your Māoriness when you were growing up? That's my question. But it's actually from Fiona Gaynor. Peace, Fiona Gaynor, even though you cut me out years ago. Thanks, Fiji, who I've never talked to for a billion years. I never noticed it. I just grew up as me. But I did notice the effect something had had on my father, who appeared to be overcompensating for his sense of Māoriness. I'd say by being better than any Pākehā at the job he did, so he could never be accused of being a lazy Māori. So that's why he became one of the best principals in the country, and I think his whole generation were like that. They wanted to prove that they were not just some dumb Māori from the pa, that they could succeed in the Pākehā world and beat Pākehā at their own game. In later life, I guess I've also carried that same value to become the best I can, but so I can open doors for Māori and also allow the Māori value system to sit comfortably side by side with any other value system in this world and not be seen as second rate. So that's my goal in life, to ensure Māori values permeate throughout our New Zealand pop culture, but in a way that inspires all New Zealanders, not only Māori, not, not just Māori. And I say, that's why the non-Māori All Blacks still do the haka, I guess. Exactly. Māori, Polynesians, Pacific Islanders. I was like, eh? And I still like, eh? He's saying, oh, anyway, I ain't gonna go on. Okay. Do you find the fascination of some Pākehā towards things Māori invasive? He says, I'm probably very forgiving. I don't see things as invasive so much as their curiosity has overcome their ignorance and they want to find out. Sometimes you can get a bit hoo-ha with them, annoyed, but generally you can also have a bit of fun with them. Keep it light so that they don't become too invasive. Probably most invasive are the Pākehā journalists who are trying to get a stereotyped Māori answer and so I just put it right back onto them and give them a very untypical cryptic reply as you can imagine I could <laughs> like I said like that's not what I wanted at all <laughs> so consequently they don't ask me many questions these days okay here we go people are people and all have their own opinion do the great spiritual teachers of the world have a special place in the Maori psyche I think within Maori society, former society, there were great teachers that were a part of our were a part of our Wananga traditions, and they have very similar values, as I can see it, to those that are carried through, say, the Dalai Lama, a sense of calm, serenity. They've seen it all before. They see the conflicts and they understand that it's part of the learnings of all peoples on this planet, and that we go through a series of lessons. So that account, the Dalai Lama, I think a lot of people, uh, so on that account, uh, the Dalai Lama, I think a lot of Māori respect him, probably see a lot in him that we used to see in those elders that have now passed on. Anyone that has such qualities, it transcends culture, it's about humanity, and I'm just hoping out of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that some individuals can step forward and transcend the violence and think again about humanity and lift the whole game, lift the people up to their higher being rather than resorting to the easiest common denominator, violence. Violence is easy, anyone can be violent, but it's the energy that it takes to actually be proactive and seek a peaceful path 
that takes courage and that's what we need in this world more courage oh. mean answer I think that's true but also to be a skilled warrior don't you have to be a real kick-ass legend man I was so young how old was I um, I don't know 26? Okay. I think that's true. Oh yeah, I'll say. But the most skilled warriors that I know of, they never raised a hand. This is what he said. And I said, like Morehi Ueshiba, a the Aikido dude. Yeah. He says like well, <laughs> probably. But yeah, he says. There was one of our ancestors back home into Ottawa. His lack of presence, physical presence, was never noticed because of his spiritual presence was so omnipresent in his part where he lived. His people lived, had, had no fortifications and anyone who came there had to lay down their weapons and come into it in peace. If they didn't, they would die. Oh, true. I was like, what the? Yeah, they would meet some unfortunate end. I get that now. I don't know how good or bad f that fits into the picture. But I guess that point the point I'm trying to make actually is that there were no there were sorry, there were role models in Maori society just like there are role models today in our modern society. Not necessarily Maori, but people who ascribe to those values of peace and aspire to growth, compassion, understanding, tolerance. Those leaders aren't constrained by culture and I think all people should take note of them because they're trying to make it a better place for all of us to live in through living their principles. Do you feel te reo is essential to Māori identity? I think te reo is an important tool in being Māori and being able to communicate in the language of your ancestors, but I think even more important is knowing your whakapapa. That is the cornerstone of Māori identity. At the end of the day, Language is a vehicle of communication, but knowing your genealogical accountability to all your kin from your ancestors through to those living today is what makes us Māori. As, as the world becomes more international, do you feel a local identity like that of the Māori will have an increased value? He says, absolutely. It's what makes us different and sets us apart from the rest of the world. As the world becomes more homogenized, globalized, Californialized, the more important it is that we, especially the local tribal network, celebrate our fluid identities across this unique landscape, seascape that we call Aotearoa, New Zealand. Otherwise, we'll just get swallowed up by the rest of the world, and no individual wants to be turned into a machine and become part of someone else's vision. We all want to have our own visions, our own dreams, and live them. So we must hold dear and precious our identity in contradistinction to all other identities on this planet. But in holding that close to ourselves, we must also be tolerant and recognize other identities and embrace their right to come and live amongst us and live their culture too. To do otherwise is to not live by Māori values of hospitality and inclusiveness. I, I said, I always thought that the old fellas would say, what are you doing here? Let's skin them. <laughs> okay, they just fight them and stuff, but I must be wrong about that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, if they turn up and they trample your mana, takataka, here to mana o te whenua, then you have a right due cause to confront them. Say, ko wai koa. So, ko wai koe, it will be, that's wrong, ko wai koe. But if they've come into the land as guests, as rivers, seeking to start a new life rather than moaning about it, I don't mean say welcome when they come to the, your door, but say here are the house rules. And they will live by them because you offer something. They actually don't live by them. They do whatever they want. More than they're just ruthless often. That's just my perspective uh, from being out there. So mean to me offer something they can't find anywhere else in the world. If we just open the door, or even worse, our treaty partners, the government, even Molly's meant to be here, anyway, everyone's meant to a weirdo. Choice, good on you. Open the door, but then don't demonstrate their accountability back to the people of the land. Then these people don't understand that the trampling on the mana 
trampling the mana of another group. We have to be careful and let them know that we are here and have been for many hundreds of years and have looked after this resource for future generations. Part of our culture is always embracing and looking after our visitors. So saying you're a visitor and we want you to feel secure in this new home, but there are some rules too that we have. But these rules are designed to facilitate a better community, not to destroy it. Don't tell them all the activists that though. <laughs> okay, and I say, we're going to read my thing and bomb my house. <laughs> oh, poor young Dave. Young Dave. No, nah, that's okay. I can read that. But Māori activists would say, Ah, those Pākehā. The, the, those Pākehās, those Asians, who are they to be here? And, you know, kick them out. This is not their land. But what it's really saying is that Hey, you guys should have come and talked to us. We've been excluded. That's what it's about. It's really simple. Let's play some values again. It comes right back to the Dalai Lama. If you go into a room and there is a conversation going on and it's about Māori values and you're Māori, the Jimfin, excluded, you'll say, hang on, hang on a sec. I want to be included in the discussion. In that discussion, I want to be included in the decision making. I want to be included in the risk and future, bene future benefit of that operation, because that's our ancestors' land that that's happening on, our ancestors' fisheries. Why are you shutting us out? If people get shut out, then they kick up a stink. All the dust rises, and you can't really see what the real issue is. The issue has basically always been an issue. The issue is exclusion. Wow, that is an intense bit of answering thought. Bit of fuckado. It's genius. My question, yeah, I've got to push through the questions to get them answered. Do you consider that a child or grandchild of a Māori brought up Pākehā could consider themselves Māori without having been taught their native customs? If they know their whakapapa, yes. What sort of cultural and identity enrichment do you think this could provide them with? A sense of belonging, a sense of direction. How do you know where you're going if you don't know where you've come from? A sense of pride. Being Māori is something to be really proud of these days in our country. It's also, for me, being Danish. But being Danish is a part of a country called Denmark. Being Māori is part of a country called New Zealand. And where else is to live is better than New Zealand. New Zealand is the most awesome country in the world. Being Māori actually connects you back into the very land itself. Into those values we talked about today. Do you celebrate? I asked them this. I was kind of just this idea. Do you celebrate the Māori Ori for their peaceful living rather than the Māori who had what appears to have been a conquest-driven society? He says there's a perception that the Māori Ori were a peaceful people. That perception has been well fostered in the last ten or fifteen years by academics and also by some descendants. At the end of the day, the Māori Ori people were conquered by another group of Māori, and we mustn't get this wrong. Māori Ori are Māori, and they lost their art form of warfare and became very peaceful, because to live otherwise in any island society will be the death of the people. You all have to pull together, especially in a harsh environment like the Chathams, and then to be confronted by one confronted one day by a group of marauding Māoris who have come from New Zealand, who have come onto the island and enslaved the women and killed the men, that has been part of our culture for hundreds of years. The Māori Ori have used, I think, politically that to capture the public's imagination that they were peaceful. I'm not saying they weren't, but they've politically utilized that for economic gain through the treaty process. I say, I'll have on the cover, Maori, please do not read the cannibal my house did. <laughs> nah. I can do the old Pakeha trick. My best mate's a Maldi, and I drink every night down at the pub with him, but... Oof. <laughs> the reason this is a very interesting but sticky topic is that if you go to the Chatham Islands, the people out there until 10 years ago did not consider themselves Maori Ori Mo Te Ate Awa, which was the invading group. They all intermarried with each other. They considered themselves Chatham Islanders, but when the treaty-driven process of fisheries and other resources came to the fore in the 90s and said to the people, 
of the islands. If you're Māori Ori, you'll get this, and if you're Te Ate, if you're te ate Awa, you'll get that, and force people to separate one from the other. But what happens is, one group over here is saying they're Te Ate Awa, and the other group is over there is saying they're Māori Ori, and they're all fighting, they're fighting each other over the same pool of money or fish. But meanwhile, they should have they should be joined together because their whakapapa is are all joined together anyway in fighting the crown and fighting the crown saying naff off to the crown this is our resource we'll decide how to deal with it as Chatham Islanders instead of saying we'll only fund Te Ate Awa or we'll only fund the Māori Ori people what happens when they said they'll only fund the Māori Ori you look at the beneficiary list and you've got all the same names that you've got over here anyway but they've chosen to bring forward another identity that will give them access to resources so being Māori Ori became a sexy identity for the Chatham Islanders Chatham Island people if they wanted to access for example the resources that have come out of the latest treaty driven process whereas 10 years ago everyone was Te Ate Awa because that gave you access to another set of resources. To come back to your question, it has been romanticized that the fighting ability and the violence that has been popularized as representing Māori society in the past, and perhaps even today, which actually was only a very small part of our culture and only happened at certain times of the season in pre-contact times. There was a fighting season and the number of people that were killed before the musket arrived was very minimal. A war was decided, probably, by one or two people fighting it out and everyone else watching. If they did all fight, often maybe three or four people would die in that battle, but everyone else would escape. It was only when the musket came and came, it became horrific, because then someone who was Todekadeka a slave of no standing could pick up a musket and kill a chief without even having to come in, to con in contact with and use that martial art because a commoner would not have known or have any control over the martial art of fighting with a taiaha or a mere and would be taken to pieces within two seconds flat so they would never end up in a fighting position but when the musket came all they had to do was have a good eye and they could kill someone of great rank. And doing that, that's <coughs> when they all started to get tattoos saying, hey, I killed a chief. I have the right to have a moko on my face. Then later on, they would have their heads chopped off because that moko could buy three more muskets. It worked out that four heads bought one musket. The crux of your question, violence, has been romanticized within Māori society as a really Māori thing to do. The reality is, though, that 11 of the 12 months of the year, Māori live very peacefully, getting on with everyday living and maintaining their resources for future descendant use, used what they could or did need to use at the time, and left the rest to go through the cycle of life. I bet they trained hard out for the fighting season too, is what I said. Those were young men. It was like going on the rugby field. Do you see old men on a, go on a rugby field? Nah. <laughs> Do they need to? That's what he said. They don't need to prove anything. Some old men dream about it. The days when they were young and the great battles they had against other tribes or other rugby teams. But wisdom comes of age and especially with broken bodies. I said, do the Māori have a more natural life view than the Pākehā? No, but they do have a sense of responsibility back to the land, making sure it's there for the next generation. But like any culture, they've learnt by their mistakes, and some mistakes are recent, and some mistakes are in the past. Our myths, 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 myths legends and traditions are all about repeating mistakes about not re <laughs> not repeating mistakes reminding us of what we did in the past where it didn't work or where it does work and building on that into the future how does modern culture particularly afro-american culture 
inform Māori youth and their values, and do these values make them more or less Māori, perhaps Pākaha in another sense? My question. His answer. I think television and multimedia are very invasive. The Californication of our people, the black Afro-American Californication, as opposed to the white McDonald's Californication, it's a dumbing down and a marginalizing of the, those values that their ancestors lived by, which are very every bit as important, if not more important, than any other value system that belongs to another culture. Bro, this guy is flipping hard out. That's so true. I see this. Is cool a concept also? And uh, is cool a Māori concept also? And how does it affect a Māori? So like being cool? He said, <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing. I think Māori have always had this standoffish, not sort of affected by anything. It's actually the men, like they're too cool to show interest, but underneath they're just as excited as anyone else, and they do not, they do want to jump in and have a look. I think it's more an age thing. Um, urban phenomenal, phenomenal, whatever, and it has a different style compared to another different cultural group of that same age. But being cool as a Pākehā is different from being cool as a Māori, is different from being cool as a Cook Islander, is different from being cool as a Samoan or a Tongan. It's about trying on identities and then eventually taking them off and just becoming yourself. Mind blown again. Is mana a relevant concept today? I was so mind blown this whole time, man. This guy is a freaking genius. Uh, is mana a relevant concept today? Mana is a very is very relevant, but it's misused. Many people see mana as a word that has something to do with rights. What mana is about comes back to responsibility. You have no mana unless you've actually served and continue to serve. You can think of it as being like, you're born with mana, like a glass of water, and what you do over your lifetime will decide whether that glass stays full or whether it becomes empty. And in time, if you've done a good job, you can pass that glass of water on to your children and your nephews and nieces and whatever you can teach them the value of keeping that glass full Realizing to keep it full, you can't drink from it. I didn't get it. I was like, I didn't understand. I said, I don't understand. He said, it's for others to drink from it for you. I was like, what? I said, but if they drink from it, then you still lose some water? I was like, what happens is they allow you to drink from theirs and we share. So your mana is measured in giving, not taking. Not in taking. And the more you give, the greater money you'll have. Far, this is just the realest, the realest. But like, your glass is only so big, isn't it? But what happens is when you, is you let everyone else have that glass of water, and what they'll do is they'll give you more back, because they want to give back. So everyone's mana then increases. It's win-win. If you just drink from your own, then the only person who can fill it up is yourself. Where are you going to fill up, fill that up from if you have no one around you? You'll become an individual, you'll, you become an island, you become lonely, and then you die a sorry death. Wow, that's ruthless, because I'm always by myself. <laughs> I ring Lifeline for a chat. <sighs> because who's going to come to your funeral? I really don't care. The trees could be around my funeral, they love me more than the people around here does, those trees, elmer trees, so does the whole community get a bigger glass or something, or something, well at the end, if everyone's got their own glass of water and it's all brought together, it becomes the collective glass of water, someone is given, given the responsibility of sharing that, that glass of water with other tribal groups, and if they do it correctly, you end up with even more water. If you don't do it right, the water spills and then everyone suffers. That's the big weight, because if you don't do it right, it could even bring, in the old days, warfare on your people. Then you will die, and it might mean crops will fail because you didn't plant them at the right time, or the fish don't come back. It's all about accountability to everything, to the ancestors, to the land, to the resources, to the birds. Uh, to, he didn't say two, he said 
the birds, the trees, and to your people, that's mana. Oh, wow. That's so awesome. I got told in Māori and resource management that it's, it is self-respect. I was led down the wrong path there, and that's why I said to your old, old man, I said, my mana, and I meant my self-respect, and he goes, you don't have any mana. And I was like, ooh, shit. What did I just do? Your self-respect, it's different. You have a personal mana that does start with your self-respect, being comfortable with yourself. You will not be able to serve others unless you have taken care of yourself first. And that's part of your exploration as a young person. What, what are your skills that you can then add to the communal glass of water? What you can give, not what you can take. Our young people have kind of got that a little bit mixed up. They see mana as take, not as give. Self-respect is about I'm secure in who I am. That's why I can give. If you've got money, you don't have to say you have it. Because if you have it, if you have to say you have it, then maybe you haven't got it. <laughs> Yo, I felt like shit about myself when I said that to him, for sure. I mean, my self-respect, that's what I was saying. I guess I didn't have any. Bah, brutal. You have it, but what you have... To give is more than that, but you don't need to s tell anyone that you have it because you're just being here now means you have it. You exist. We exist. You're watching this. I'm here. And this is in the room, of course. How can we do this? Your existence is a demonstration of the mana of your ancestors. It's how it's now imbued within you to breathe today in their memory. And I think. The traditional Māori believe that men are directly descended from the gods and as such of sacred power and that women in contrast are of the earth and of common substance. This is as reported by Dr. Terence Barrow in an illustrated guide to Māori art. Well, he says, well, they might believe it, but they wouldn't say it so the woman heard it. <laughs> That's... It's about complementarities, and as much as women are connected to nurture and men like to think of themselves as connected to the arts work, it's also the other way around as well. It's about who does what and how they complement each other and female, male. The best way to describe it is the yin and yang. The yang, yin and yang. That's what he said. I'm saying this verbatim, by the way. I'm trying to say what he said exactly. Uh, yep. That's Māori society as well, very much so. It's not a separate separation, it's not an either or, it's the and. Out of the and come more exciting, more exciting ideas and more exciting ways of enga engaging with our universe. So the men might speak on the marae, and only those who are qualified will speak on the marae, like only the qualified woman will do the kāranga to allow the men to speak. The woman in our tribe, to Ottawa, they run the economy. The men might like to talk it up when they get the opportunity, but how, how about how we are the bosses? But at the end of the day, it's the woman that actually do the hard yards and make sure that the men have the place and space to actually talk it up. Bruh. Bruh. Thanks for talking to me. That's cool. And thank you very much. Paul Tapsell was interviewed by Dave Patterson over a cup of hot chai. Papai for that, Paul. You're a generous dude. All the art is Dave, by Dave Patterson. And thanks for reading. Have a great day. Peace out. Gee. That, this, was, this, this was a challenge to do this. To make, to make that. Okay. If you want a hard copy, just ask me. I'll see if I can like make one for you. Um, you'll have to pay some fee that whatever it costs me to make it. Obviously, I do art all day, every day, and good arts ain't never about the coinage. It's just about the art. But then, gotta have some fresh threads. Gotta have some food. Some food for thoughts. 
some gift, some money for gifts for others, some blessings. Check out this. Yeah. Stay awake to the ways of the world. This shit is deep. Peace. It's an original gasp. It's a number four of fifty print. Peace, gasp. Peace, everyone. Thanks for watching. That interview took an hour, and I just read it to you in fifty-five ish minutes. Pretty good going. Hopefully, it was all good. <laughs>